Good morning, everyone. My name is Brett Felton, and I'm the National Industrial Market Manager here at Graybar. I'd like to welcome you to Graybar's G2 Talk presentation on short circuit current ratings of electrical equipment and industrial machines. This talk is a part of a webinar series we offer each month for our industrial customers. We've got a great discussion lined up for you today, uh, but before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, if you were one of the first 50 people who joined in on this presentation today, you will receive a coupon for a free cup of coffee courtesy of Graybar as a thank you for your time today. So thank you. Also, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box for Q&A. Feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation. We'll address as many questions as time permits at the end of the presentation. But if we don't get to your question today, we will make sure that a Graybar representative follows up with you. Lastly, our G2 talks are all archived on the graybar.com website. So you'll be able to view the presentation again at your leisure or recommend it to others, and please do so. We're happy to team up today with Eaton's Busman Business. As an electrical distributor, Graybar works alongside Busman to provide quality solutions for the electrical infrastructure of your facility and machinery. At this time, I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dan Neeser. Dan has been with Busman since 1996 and currently holds the position of field application engineer. His specialty is the design and application of overcurrent protective devices in electrical distribution systems in accordance with the National Electrical Code and ensuring equipment is in accordance with the various product standards. He participates in, tri in IEEE as a senior member with industrial and commercial power systems, with NEMA, and as a committee member for NFPA. He's also involved with UL and the IAEI. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Dan. Take it away, Dan. Thanks, Brett. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk about SCCR, or Short Circuit Current Ratings of Equipment. Um, this is really a topic that has come into uh, prevalence um, in recent years due to uh, some code changes we'll talk about uh, in the 2005 NEC. Before we start talking about SCCR, it's very important to differentiate uh, SCCR from a term called interrupting rating. And if you look in the NEC, interrupting rating is the highest current that an overcurrent device, either a fuse or a breaker, um, is ready to safely interrupt. Um, this identifies the ability of the overcurrent device, the fuse or breaker, to safely interrupt current, uh, fault current. However, it doesn't necessarily uh, determine protection of downstream components, so hence it's a self-protection rating only. Um, NEC 110.9 requires the interrupting rating of the overcurrent device to be adequate, uh, equal to or greater than the maximum available fault current. And this, uh, to determine the maximum available fault current, you would have to do a calculation, uh, and that can be based upon uh, the size of your system and where you're located in your system. Um, in addition, there are similar requirements in OSHA 1910-303-B4 so regardless of whether it's a new installation uh, per the NEC or whether it's an existing installation per OSHA, we need to make sure that our overcurrent devices have adequate SCC, I'm sorry, adequate interrupting rating uh, so that they don't have a potentially uh, explosive situation there. Um, what can happen is if they do experience fault current above their interrupting rating, they actually can explode. Um, it's very important in this uh, uh, session to, deter, to understand the difference between uh, series ratings and interrupting rating. Series ratings are uh, the ability of a circuit breaker to be applied beyond its marked interrupting rating, provided they have a overcurrent device, either a breaker or fuse, that is able to protect that circuit breaker at higher fault current. And the only way to do that is to test that. Um, if you look in NEC 240.86, it will require new installations to have series ratings that are tested, listed, and marked, and they can be applied then in panel boards and switchboards. 
The reason I bring this up is that this is not able to be done when it comes to uh, SCCR for industrial control panels. So this is a technique that is only permitted for new installations and in panel boards and switchboards, not necessarily industrial control panels. So that brings us to SCCR, or short circuit current ratings. And this is a term that identifies the highest current that equipment, okay, other than breakers or fuses, can withstand without extensive damage. And we say extensive damage because the UL product standards actually do allow some damage during, to the components uh, during uh, the test, however, it cannot result in either a fire or shock hazard. Um, you might call this a combination rating. Um, this is a, a rating between an overcurrent device and a component, for instance, perhaps a, uh, a contactor and a fuse or a circuit breaker. And in some cases, it might be based upon a specific type of overcurrent device. So, for instance, you might have an uh, adjustable speed drive that requires a specific class of fuse for protection of that. If we look into NEC 110.10, Somewhere to 110.9, this requires adequate SCCR of equipment. So NEC 110.9 requires appropriate interrupting ratings, whereas NEC 110.10 requires appropriate SCCR for the equipment. So again, we have to do the fault current calculation based upon where we are in our system. And in addition to that, um, this also applies uh, with, with OSHA. OSHA does require us to have adequate SCCR, and that's really where the, the, the big challenge is for our industrial customers. Our industrial customers probably have a lot of equipment in their facility that was never identified with SCCR, so it's very difficult to assure compliance if you don't know what the fault current rating of your equipment is. As we mentioned, um, you need to do a fault current calculation, and you can do this by hand or you can do this using tools. Um, there are programs you can pay for, uh, such as SKM or Easy Power. However, if you want a simple, free program, uh, Eaton Busman's Business does offer you what's called our uh, Busman FC2 Fault Current Calculator. And this is available either online, or you can actually go to your Apple or your Android App Store and download it for free. Um, by using this program, you can determine your fault current based upon transformers, conductors, or busway. And again, that's when we do a fault current calculation, that's all we look at. We look at either the, the source, uh, either a transformer or utility, and then we base it upon conductors or busway added impedance, and we would do the calculation through our system to see and determine what the fault current is. This program allows you to uh, print out a PDF of the system, and the characteristics of, the, of this system that you did the calculation with, as well as a label that can be applied to your equipment to identify the fault current at that equipment. This slide shows the changes that were put into the 2005 NEC. And what this indicates is now we are required, per the NEC, to mark our motor controllers, our HVAC equipment above 60 amps, our industrial control panels, and industrial machinery um, with the appropriate SCCR. So we have to identify this equipment with the SCCR uh, for it. Um, in addition, in uh, 2011, we added requirements in 409.22 and 670.5 that assured or required that the actual fault current cannot exceed the marked SCCR. So what that is saying is the actual fault current you calculate based upon the impedance of your system, the transformers, the conductors, bus wave, cannot exceed the value that's marked on that equipment. So the equipment itself must be adequate for the fault current. Um, the typical method for determining the SCCR of equipment is UL 508A supplement SB, and that's kind of a what we might call a weak link method. Um, as you'll see, basically you look at your components, um, in your, in your uh, panel, and you take the weak link of that. Um, many manufacturers, however, don't understand or realize the importance of providing equipment with higher SCCR. And as such, they would just provide typically a 5KA rating. And the unfortunate part about that is that usually would not be um, adequate for uh, your system. 
So how do we determine the SCCR for equipment? The, the first method would be to actually test the equipment. However, for a lot of our equipment, we're doing custom equipment, and testing really is not an option for that. So the vast majority of equipment, especially industrial control panels, would be determined by the approved method, that UL 508A supplement SB method. Um, there really is no other AHJ approved method that I'm familiar with, so the uh, 508A method is typically the one that's being done. Um, we should also mention, too, that if you do have in, uh, instances where you have uh, existing equipment and you're looking to comply with the OSHA requirements for proper SCCR, you might look at a uh, field evaluation from a nationally recognized testing laboratory, such as UL, ETL, or so forth. So let's just kind of understand what we're talking about, specifically when it comes to an industrial control panel. An industrial control panel is really just a general term that identifies that we have an assembly with two or more components in a box, basically. Now, those components might be power circuit components, control components, or more likely a combination of both power and control. And it's important to note that the, for an industrial control panel, it does not include the controlled equipment. If it did, it would then be considered industrial machinery. So let's look at UL 508A Supplement SB more in detail. And a common question that comes up is, what components do uh, we have to analyze or affect the SCR of the assembly? And the answer is only power circuit components. Um, so the only components that affect the SCCR are components that supply loads. So what are loads that we'd have to consider? Those would be motors, lighting, heating, appliance, and often receptacles. Um, so the disconnect switches, fuses, breakers, controllers, so forth, those that supply loads would affect the SCCR. Um, there is a new exception that just got put into UL 508A Supplement SB in December of last year, and that was that HVAC equipment rated above 60 amps does not affect the SCCR. And that kind of correlates with the uh, National Electrical Code. And if the industrial control panel does happen to have an enclosure air conditioner, that does not affect the SCCR. And of course, control circuits, your push buttons, pile of lights, selector switches do not affect the SCCR either. So the, 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 the most challenging part of the uh, determination of SCCR for equipment is to actually determine what the SCCR for the individual components are. And there are basically three techniques for that. The first and the most common is to look what's actually marked on the component, or in many cases there's not room on the component, so they have to mark the SCCR on the instructions that come with that component. Um, if you cannot find that, you always can look at a default rating. However, the default rating is typically going to get you into that 5KA equipment, so that's best avoided. Um, finally, if you're in look, especially if you're looking at high SCCR equipment, you're going to be wanting to get combination ratings. And what that means is the equipment manufacturer, the, the manufacturer of the controller, for instance, has taken that to a lab and he's tested beyond the standard fault rating. So maybe he's tested his controller with a circuit breaker or fuse for 65,000 amps. And those ratings can be used provided they're tested and documented by the manufacturer. So when we look at the Busman method for determining the SCCR of industrial control panels, we look at it from a two-sweep method. The first sweep, we look only at components, okay, anything other than a fuse or a circuit breaker. Now we'll analyze the fuse and circuit breakers separately in sweep two. So sweep one, we're looking at the components, um, the contactors, the starters, the switches, the controllers, so forth. And again, we're going to try to use combination ratings if that's possible. Um, we'll look at making sure we supply that with a specified overcurrent device to get that combination ratings. And in many cases, it may not be uh, obvious what those ratings are, so you may have to check with the manufacturer for the combination ratings. Uh, here's an example of how we can apply combination ratings in the feeder. Um, for instance, Busman offers power distribution blocks. Um, our power distribution blocks have high SCCR 
when protected by a specific type of fuse. So um, in this instance here, we might be able to have a high SCCR PDB, provided we have a specific ampacity and class of fuse ahead of that, and then that combination would become 100 kA. The next slide shows how we would apply a similar uh, device in the branch. Uh, perhaps that would be a contactor or perhaps a motor starter. And again, the manufacturer has tested that component with a specific overcurrent device, which we supplied, and the combination of that overcurrent device and the component is good for 100 kA. So that's one way how we can uh, uh, increase our assembly SCCR is by selecting components that have been combination tested um, at higher fault current levels. Now there is a provision. In many cases, you might have a manufacturer that tested with a specific type of overcurrent device, but perhaps you want to use something that is uh, different from that, and that's permitted per the UL508A Supplement SB method, provided you use a, a product or a, an overcurrent device, pardon me, with a uh, better or equal performance. So I could substitute a current limiting fuse uh, that's more current limiting for the one that was tested, or I could uh, provide it in the field, if Mark, if they wanted to not to provide it in the panel, it could be provided in the field, or you could provide a current limiting circuit breaker that was more current limiting than the circuit breaker used for the test. Um, this new exception here, exception number four, allows you to use a current limiting device in lieu of a non-current limiting device and maintain the combination rating. So for instance, if we had a contactor that was tested with a non-current limiting circuit breaker, I could substitute a current limiting overcurrent device of equal ampacity and still maintain that high fault current rating. So um, what if we can't fix the components with combination ratings? Or often what happens is we will fix the components with combination ratings and then try to increase beyond that rating. So for instance, let's say we picked components with all 65 kA ratings, but we want to have an assembly of 200 kA. This would be one example where we might be able to look, to look at the current limiting overcurrent devices to increase the uh, branch circuit component ratings, or we could look at small rated transformers. The key is that the current limiting device, whether it's a overcurrent device or whether it's a transformer, must be located in the feeder circuit, and they can only increase branch circuit components. Okay, so visually, here's what it looks like. The branch circuit is basically from your load to the first overcurrent device as shown in green. Everything on the line side of that would be the feeder circuit. So we'd have to apply either the current limiting over current device or the current uh, the transformer in the yellow area, and then we could only fix the components in the green area. Now there are some specific rules on how we can use the let through of current limiting over current devices. And again, First, the current limiting device must be in the feeder circuit. Second, if it comes to fuses, we have to, in breakers, we have to use the peak let through, not the RMS let through. Uh, so for instance, the RMS let through might be uh, 6,000 amps, whereas the peak is 10. And that is done because when we test the current limiting fuses or current limiting breakers, we only document the peak let through. So it's basically a more conservative value that we document. Secondly, if I use current limiting fuses, we have to use the worst case let through tables from UL248. We can't use manufacturer specific data as it stands today. Now with current limiting circuit breakers, they don't have default let through values like, like fuses do. In that case, they can use the actual uh, published let through curves for the circuit breakers. The real challenge here, however, though, is that the circuit breaker to do this must be listed and marked current limiting, and as many of you know, that is usually not a condition uh, for most circuit breakers. And then secondly, 
the components can the circuit breakers or the fuses the let through can only be used to raise the branch circuit components contactors motor starters drives for instance it can never raise the interrupting rating of the overcurrent device or devices such as combination motor controllers perhaps like a, a type e starter you cannot raise that those values using the let through um, so here we have an example. Um, we have an, a current limiting overcurrent device in the feeder, and that can be used. We'd find the let through at a given fall current of, uh, for the overcurrent device, and provided the let through at that given fall current was less than the standalone rating of the component, shown in orange, we can raise that component to the fall current of the let through. So for instance, this might have been a 10 kA component, and the let through was 8,000 amps at 100,000 amps. So since the let through of the yellow overcurrent device in the feeder is less than the standalone rating of the component at 100 kA, we can raise that to the fall current value of 100 kA. However, please note that the box in red, the overcurrent devices, cannot be used uh, to be raised by the let through. So if that was a 14 kA circuit breaker ahead of the component, you could not use the let through of the fuse, 8 kA, for instance, to raise that from 14 kA to 100 kA. You can only do that for components. You cannot do that for overcurrent devices. Um, here's a new change, and this change allows you to provide that overcurrent device in the field. So, for instance, in the previous slide, we had a, a fuse in the feeder, or perhaps a current limiting breaker in the feeder, and we could provide that in the field, i.e. have the customer provide that, provided he uh, properly marked what was required for that per the SB 5.1.3. So um, basically this allows uh, the user to provide the overcurrent device as opposed to the OEM have it be installed in the equipment. It can be installed outside his equipment provided by the user of the industrial and still maintain the high SCCR. Okay, for transformers, transformers are a little bit more simple and straightforward. Um, again, as you as noted, the current limiting device, in this case a transformer, must be in a feeder circuit. So really that should say a uh, transformer must be in the feeder circuit. Um, when it, uh, previously, for transformers, there was only two rules that you could use, either a rule for a 10 kVA transformer or a rule for a 5 kVA transformer. And perhaps graphically, it's easiest to show this. So here we have a situation, and the rule is, if I have a 10 kVA transformer, the worst case fall current that can ever be let through for that 10 kVA transformer is 5,000 amps. Uh, so basically, if my components on the load side of the 10 kVA transformers are rated 5,000 amps or higher, what becomes the limiting factor in that case is the overcurrent device interrupting rating on the primary side. So in the example shown, we have a 10 kA branch uh, component and a 5 kA branch component on the load side of the transformer. That's, those are greater, equal to or greater than 5 kA. So what we can then do is apply the interrupting rating or the 200 kA rating to the entire circuit. If it was a 5 kVA with a 120 volt secondary, then the fault current left through would be only 2 kA. So my components would only have to be 2 kA or higher to apply the same rule. Um, one thing that was changed recently, again, the, there were several changes that were documented in the uh, standard UL 508 standard in December of this of last year. And what they did was they actually installed or put in equations or formulas to determine the calculation. And they also put in tables based upon a set uh, impedance value for the transformer for both one phase and three phase transformers and also higher uh, KVA transformers. So now you can use the effect of transformers um, in, a, in a much broader range than previous, uh, previously before. So you can use for higher KVA transformers and single phase and three phase. So it's much more flexible now uh, that we've made this change. 
And last, again, as I mentioned earlier on, we have a two-sweep method. The first sweep dealt with power circuit components, anything other than a breaker or fuse. And now we need to go back and make sure that we identify what the interrupting rating of the breakers or fuses used in our assembly were and take the lowest of the two between sweep one or sweep two. So in sweep two, we're going to look at all the interrupting ratings for the overcurrent devices um, and remembering that we have to look at the feeder and the branch circuit overcurrent devices. And we can never use tested uh, series combination ratings or series ratings to raise the ratings of circuit breakers. So for instance, we can never use uh, a, a, a fuse or a circuit breaker that's been series rated tested with a downstream breaker to increase that rating. That is not permitted. Um, we also need to look for branch circuit devices that are tapped from the feeder circuit. That's very common. Often they'll tap from a, a feeder circuit, go to a branch circuit uh, device there, maybe a maintenance lighting. That overcurrent device would affect it. And we also need to look at overcurrent devices for control circuit transfers and a motor branch circuit. So you might have had a, a fuse or a circuit breaker that uh, provided the branch circuit protection for a single motor circuit, but then they tap off and go to a control transformer that overcurrent device could be either supplemental or branch circuit, and it could be used to, uh, that would actually affect the SCCR of the equipment. So we have to consider that IR of the breaker or fuse for that control circuit to uh, affect the assembly SCCR. So the common question is why high SCCR? And many users today, whether it's a consulting engineer, an industrial, a contractor, they're realizing that the typical 5KA ratings are not adequate for the system where the equipment's being installed. Um, and it's getting more uh, inspection um, uh, overview as of, as of well. So uh, many in the customers, whether it's the, the end user, the contractor, the, the engineer, are realizing that they need to specify higher SCCR equipment for their facilities, okay? And there's obviously many benefits to this. The, the most common or our, uh, benefits are uh, flexibility of application. Uh, perhaps you have a uh, industrial facility that has a variety of different installations and he wants equipment that can travel from one installation to another. So they might say, uh, well, geez, our installations typically have fault currents of 35,000 amps. Therefore, we want all our equipment to have an SCCR of 35,000 amps or higher, so I can basically install that in any of our facilities. Or um, perhaps a more common one is they don't know the fault current. Um, maybe they haven't done a fault current study for their, for their system in some time. Uh, maybe they know the fault current at their service point, and maybe they'll just say that we want the equipment to be rated for the fault current at our service point. That way we know we're always covered uh, for that uh, possible fault current. So very important to, to have uh, the, the right SCCR um, and high SCCR. So what does that mean to the OEM to get high SCCR? As you probably can tell based upon the presentation, if he wants to uh, get uh, assemblies or industrial control panels that are good for, let's say, 65 KA, the first thing he's going to need to do is he's going to need to uh, acquire and utilize overcurrent devices that have a standalone interrupting rating uh, of 65 KA or higher. So he has to use either a class R, class J, class T, class CC fuses, or he has to use circuit breakers 65 KA rated um, to achieve that high SCCR of 65 K if that was his goal. What that means to him is if he's using circuit breakers, he might have to pay more money to get that higher rated circuit breaker. And then secondly, he's going to have to look at components. Um, he might have to use different terminal blocks or power distribution blocks, um, fuse holders, disconnects, so forth. Um, and the good thing, Busman does provide high SCCR components such as terminal blocks, power distribution blocks, fuse holders. We also have new disconnects that are, that are with high SCCR that are called our compact circuit protector. And uh, those are often very beneficial in uh, achieving a high SCCR for his overall assembly. 
So with that, uh, I think we'll roll into questions, and I'll, I guess I'll turn it back to, uh, to Brett for any questions that might have popped up. Hey, thank you, Dan. That was an excellent presentation. And yes, at this time, uh, we'd like to address some questions that have been submitted. Uh, Dan, we've had some very good ones come in here, so uh, uh, please hang with us. I'm going to take a Great. bit of your time here for these questions. Uh, first of all, we had a, a handful of folks ask, um, ask to see that slide showing the uh, a free tool that you had to determine the fault current. Sure. Let me uh, go to that real quick. There yeah, we go. I don't know if it was 7 of 31 or 8. Yep. It should be shown on the yeah, slide. Yeah, you now. can expand on that a little bit for the audience. Excellent. Yes, I, I, as you can kind of tell, I kind of rushed through to make sure we'd get through all the slides. Um, this is a, uh, a program. Um, years ago, we used to offer a program that you could download to your computer. Um, however, with the advent of uh, newer Windows versions, that would no longer operate on the current Windows systems. So what we did was we developed a program. And basically how you would use this program or acquire this program is you just I, what I recommend is go to your website and type in Busman uh, FC2, Fault Current Calculator. And it will take you to a landing page uh, that's kind of shown in the middle of my screen there. And from that page, you can go to your app store, um, or you can go to your app store on your phone and go directly to it as well. Um, but if you go to our landing page that's shown there in the middle, you can actually enter some information, uh, your name, so forth, um, and then you can run it online. And that will allow you, as you can kind of see there, to do a fault current calculation for either single-phase systems or three-phase systems. And you can run it right from your website and do the same features or same uh, content that you can do on the mobile app. So if you do have an Apple store, uh, an Apple product or an Android product, you can go to your, uh, your app store on your phone. Again, type in Busman. You'll find two programs, either an FF program, which is a Fuse Finder program, or an FC2, which is a fault calculator program we just talked about here. Um, so what you would do is you would start off using the program either online or on your phone. Uh, you would pick either three-phase or single-phase, uh, probably most likely a three-phase system. And then you would just choose the type of calculation. As mentioned, you can do either a transform calculation or a conductor or bus. So as kind of shown on the left of my screen here, um, there's a transformer. That was the first calculation we did. Then we added a conductor and then another conductor. And you're able to email yourself a PDF of that system that you just created and then you're also e uh, able to pick a point in your system. So for instance, maybe at the load side of your transfer, you wanted to create a label. You could create a label, and that would be the label that's shown uh, there in the uh, lower left of your screen that you then could affix to the equipment showing the fault current at that equipment. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. There's, there's quite a bit of interest amongst the audience on that, so I appreciate you going over that again. Absolutely. Okay, uh, next question, uh, again from a uh, member of the audience. What is the difference between AIC and SCCR? Great question. Um, AIC, what they're really talking about, that is short for amps interrupting capacity. And really, AIC is the exact same thing as IR, interrupting rating. So whether I say IR or AIC, what I'm really talking about is the ability of an overcurrent device to interrupt a given fault current. So if we have an AIC of 65,000 amps, that means that the overcurrent device can interrupt safely 65,000 amps. Now SCCR on, a, on uh, the difference is that SCCR applies to equipment. So perhaps we have a contactor that has an SCCR of 65,000 amps. What that says is that, the, that that contactor can withstand 65,000 amps. Now, again, understand that that 65,000 amp SCCR for that contactor may be dependent upon a specific overcurrent device. Maybe it's a specific circuit breaker or perhaps a specific fuse. All right, thank you. Uh, Dan, the next one from our, our I'm sorry, 
from our audience. Uh, with regards to HVAC equipment, uh, say HVAC equipment above 60 amps, uh, is that supposed to have SCCR marking as well per NEC? Yes, exactly. The NEC requires you to mark the SCCR of, of HVAC equipment, provided it's above 60 amps. And I should mention, too, that the UL standard, UL 1995, is going to require the same. So whether it's per the NEC or whether it's per the UL product standard, if you, acquire, if you purchase a piece of HVAC equipment that's rated above 60 amps per the UL product standard, to list that, you must mark the SCCR of that equipment. All right. Thanks again. Okay, next question. Uh, again, we've got some very good ones from the audience, so uh, hang with us, Dan. Uh, right. When making an analysis, do you assume the power company has an infinite bus, or do you make assumptions based upon the cable feeder sizes? That's a great question. You can do either one. Um, the, the, typically, the first starting point would be a, uh, a connection to your utility. And in many cases, your utility may provide the transformer, and you just take service at, let's say, 480 volts. In that case, you can either you can get the worst-case fault current from the utility, or you could do a worst-case fault current from the utility um, or from the transformer, and then to use our calculator to do what's called an infinite bus primary. So, for instance. You can either go to the utility and find out what their worst-case fall current would be for that given transformer, or you can look at the transformer that's being installed uh, for, your, for your system, and you can find the KVA and the impedance of that transformer and use that to determine the fall current, uh, again, using either uh, infinite bus on the secondary. From that point, you would probably do a second calculation based upon the conductors from the transformer to the service equipment, and then do that calculation to determine the fault current at your service. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next question, uh, does Busman or Eaton have current limiting uh, circuit breakers that are UL listed? The answer is yes, we do. Um, most manufacturers, not only just Eaton, but also um, you know, Square D and, and, and other manufacturers will offer a line of circuit breakers that are marked and listed current limiting. Um, the real challenge for the industrial or the OEM is that these devices are often going to be very expensive. So the, um, the reason why perhaps they might not go to a current limiting circuit breaker, although it's available, might be cost. Um, in many cases, they might just need overcurrent protection, and they can put in, um, you know, three class J fuses, which might be more economical than a current limiting circuit breaker. And that's one thing that we find is that in many cases, if you want to get high SCCR assembly equipment, they often use more fuses um, to achieve that high SCCR rating due to cost implications than they might with breakers. All right. Thank you. Uh, Question that came in from the audience here, what are umbrella fuses? <laughs> Excellent question. And, and that gets into kind of, uh, if I can kind of go to uh, one of the slides here. Um, I think it's this one here. Um, if you look at my, on this slide, when I talk about the using the left through of fuses, um, the second bullet point there says fuses cannot use manufacturer-specific fuse data, only tables based upon performance requirements from UL248. So what, what that means is when I test fuses, I have to meet certain let-through limits, peak let-through and i squared t limits at a given fault current, 50,000 amps, 100,000 amps, 200,000 amps. Now an umbrella fuse is a fuse that would be available for testing purposes, but it would be just above those left through limits. So for instance, we might have a customer who wants to test his contactor with a 200 amp class J fuse, and he would require a, uh, a umbrella fuse to do that testing. He couldn't use an actual production fuse. He'd have to find a fuse at a given fault current that has let through 
equal to or greater than the worst case fault current per the UL 248 standard. Um, and we typically, some manufacturers offer those um, and sell those products as part of their portfolio. And in some cases, like Busman, we basically would sell those as special fuses we'd use called umbrella fuses. They're t traditionally not available through distribution. Okay. Thank you, Dan. A um, couple more questions here with the time we have. Uh, here's one. If I have a PLC control cabinet, is SCCR required to be marked? Great question. Um, and the answer would be no. Um, again, a PLC would be considered a control circuit component, and as such, you would not require to have an SCCR. And actually, in the NEC, if you look in Article 409, there's actually an exception that says SCCR is not required for assemblies containing only control circuit components. So if I had an, an, a, uh, an enclosure that housed just a PLC, um, that assembly would not require a marked SCCR because the PLC is control. All right, thank you. And last one here based on the time we have. Uh, how can we raise the SCCR in a meter socket? <laughs> That is a, a great question. Um, the SCCR in a meter socket, typically what you're going to have to do is you, you would have to get a, uh, equipment from the manufacturer that would have adequate SCCR for that meter socket. So there, there are many um, uh, manufacturers um, that would offer a high SCCR meter socket. Um, I can think of a couple offhand. Um, in my area that would offer high SCCR. And typically what they would do is they would incorporate many times fuses, um, perhaps class J or class T fuses, in their equipment to, to increase the SCCR of that meter socket. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend looking at installing fuses ahead of the meter socket to raise that equipment SCCR. Um, I would typically recommend purchasing a, a meter socket with a high SCCR where the manufacturer has actually done testing associated with that to assure we have adequate SCCR for that equipment. And I do, I do know that manufacturers of meter sockets do offer high SCCR equipment. Okay, thanks. And Dan, I am going to take one more and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, okay. Can you explain a little further what the user can do to provide field devices to increase SCCR. I'm sorry, can you say that one last one? Yeah, can you explain a little more what the user can do to provide field devices to increase SCCR? Well, typically, and, and I think what the, what, the, what the question is pertaining to is, um, let's say we have a piece of equipment that arrives on a job site, and unfortunately the equipment has an SCCR of only 5,000 amps. However, where this is being installed, the fault current is above 5,000 amps. Um, at that point, the, the most common method to lower the fault current to the equipment would be through the use of impedance. So the, the user could look at an, applying a transformer in the field that would lower the fault current to a value within the rating of the equipment, uh, the SCCR of the equipment being installed, or you could add more conductors. Um, there may be a possibility in some specific cases that I'd, unfortunately I don't have to go into time to, but there might be a possibility a current limiting fuse could be used to uh, lower the fault current to equipment. However, that is usually not the preferred method. Um, there, there are many special conditions there. Uh, for instance, um, if, the few, if the equipment had circuit breakers in there, we wouldn't want to be using the fuse left through to protect the circuit breakers in that equipment. Again, that'd be a series ratings, and that would not be permitted for industrial control panels. So you have to be very cognizant of that, of what's in your in your panel before you start using the fuse left through uh, to show protection of that industrial control panel. All right, thanks again, Dan. Uh, and uh, we still have questions coming in. Uh, but I, I apologize to the audience. We've uh, reached our time at this point. Uh, but we will be working with Dan to make sure that your questions are answered appropriately. 
and that a gray bar representative will reach out to you and follow up on those questions. Uh, so Dan, thank you once again for your time today. Uh, outstanding job in this presentation. Um, to the audience, as a reminder, this presentation will be archived on the graybar.com website. Again, thank you for your time today, and we hope that you join us again next month on our next industrial-focused G2 Talk webinar. Thank you.